So if you joined us just five days ago for Christmas Eve, we celebrated Jesus Christ being born into this world, a baby being born into this broken world for us. You show up at church five days later, and all of a sudden, we're only two chapters ahead. We were reading Matthew 1 and 2 on Christmas Eve, and then in one page, we flip over to Matthew chapter 4, and Jesus is 30 years old. Like, what happened? What happened in one page? It's kind of a, a fast-forward mentality that we see here in Scripture. And uh, just to give you some context around what has happened in two chapters between Jesus Christ being a baby and now all of a sudden 30 years old, he, he's been a laborer working with his hands most of the time in carpentry or masonry. And really, there's no detailed explanation here about what happened over the course of those 25, 30 years. But what we do know is that during this time, during this one page, Jesus Christ was faithful. He continued to learn. He continued to study. He continued to grow. He continued to live a sinless life so that once we get into chapter three and four, he was able to live out his public ministry between the ages of 30 and 33. And maybe this is the only note that you need to take for this morning. Maybe this is kind of where you're sitting at in life. Be faithful in the mundane gaps of life. Be faithful in the day-to-day -day mundane gaps of life. A lot of times we think our lives should be a highlight reel. There's big things happening and I have great things to post on social media all the time of fireworks going off and great things in my life. And when we read the Bible, for the most part, it kind of is a highlight reel. Highlights of what Paul's doing and the big things that happen in Peter's life. But it doesn't talk about what Peter was doing with his family on Monday morning every single week. What he did on Tuesday afternoon the mundane gaps are kind of glossed over, but it is important to do the right thing, to make the right decision day after day, to be faithful because the majority of our lives are lived in the gaps as we wait on God's timing for what he wants to do with us. So the question is, will I, Adam Painter, be faithful in the gaps? Will you be faithful in the gaps? And that's a, that's a sermon in itself for another day. That could take you 40 minutes right there. But I just wanted to kind of gloss over that as we fast forward from Jesus being born to all of a sudden he's 30 years old. Today's passage is the temptation of Jesus. And this occurs right after he is baptized. He's declared in public that he is the son of God. God the Father tells Jesus out loud that he is proud of him before he even does anything in his public ministry. And that's something that we need to know in our lives. A lot of times we think like, hey, Jesus isn't, isn't proud of me unless I'm doing something big for his kingdom or for his name. But you see this order of operations here that even before Jesus begins his public ministry, God says, I'm proud of him. I'm well pleased with Jesus Christ, my son. This temptation of Jesus is kind of a, a last bit of preparation before he's going to go out into his public ministry. And one thing we see here, which is important to note, that the devil tries to derail Jesus before he even gains any momentum in his public ministry. The devil will do the same to you and I. I think sometimes we think, ah, spiritual warfare, that's just for the senior pastor, Mark Pritchard, or that's just for the elders. The devil's going to attack them. They're the ones, you know, doing all the ministry, right? But really, the devil wants to derail us before we even get going in doing big things for his name. Spiritual warfare is real. Satan won't wait until you become the boss in your company or step into some type of leadership sphere in your life. The devil will try to attack. So we are in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Again, it is page 472 in the Blue Bibles. Verse 1. We'll take it verse by verse here as we kind of walk through it. It starts off saying, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus 
led by the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of Luke, we, say that he, we see that he is full of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we should kind of probably em- emulate in our lives, that we're allowing ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit to be full of the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to direct our decisions and steps in life. And as Jesus goes into the wilderness by himself, he's going to be tempted by the devil. Not just the three times that we see here. He's tempted the entire 40 days. And I think because we watch so many um, comic uh, Marvel movies and superhero movies, we think like, man, this is the epic battle right here. I mean, Tis the season right now for Star Wars, right? So I just want to kind of illustrate what, what this does not look like. Because I think sometimes we, we misinterpret this. And we see in one corner, we see the devil, Kylo Ren, his lightsaber. And we think, man, the devil is tough. The devil's got his weapon ready. And he's, he's ready to slice and fire. And we think... Man, that's, that's going to be a pretty tough battle. I don't know how Jesus is going to fend him off. And then we see in the other corner, we think, yeah, here's Jesus over here. And what did he do? He grabs his lightsaber as well because he's got his weapon of choice, right? Because this is what the Jews thought was coming. They thought there was a Messiah coming with muscle that was going to take down the Roman Empire with physical force. So this is what they thought. They thought there was going to be this savior, this Messiah. And we think, man, this is a back and forth fight that's going to take place where Jesus is over here and all of a sudden Jesus gets knocked down by the devil. And just like any good superhero movie, all of a sudden there's a time where the bad guy is over the good guy. And you think the good guy's going to lose. How are they ever going to get out of this situation? And then there's this epic comeback and the good guy wins and the bad guy is put down and dead. And this is not what we see in scripture. It is not an even fight. It isn't like the devil has a 50-50 chance in this battle. There's never any chance or time where Jesus is on his back and he's losing the fight. Also what we see here is the devil doesn't use a lightsaber to fight. He doesn't use a machete or an assault rifle. What he uses is lies, schemes. We see in John chapter 8, verse 44, that he is called the father of lies. That is his primary weapon, is lying to us, twisting our beliefs. And what we'll also see with Jesus Christ is he doesn't need a weapon. He's going to use a different type of weapon, but we'll wait until we get there. Verse two, as we go on in this battle, so to speak, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and in one of the biggest no-brainers in the Bible, he was hungry. Uh, Yeah, you skip one meal and all of a sudden we're all starving and dying on the couch. Give me some food. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry. Why is this even mentioned in here? What we really need to know is this this highlights Jesus' humanity, that he can relate to us. He can sympathize with us. The importance here of mentioning Jesus was fasting was, I think, because when we are tired, when we are hungry, when we are at our weakest, it is easy to be derailed. You would think, man, if the devil ever has a chance at taking Jesus down, it's when he's weak. And that is most weak point. I think when it comes to parenting, a lot of times if I'm tired or hungry, like I'm willing to cave into anything my kids want. Like, Daddy, can we watch YouTube for seven hours? Yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm tired. I'm hungry. Just go away. Daddy, can we eat candy for dinner? Yeah, all of it. Go ahead. Just, uh, Daddy, can we sled off the roof? Sure, whatever. I'm tired. I'm hungry. Like we're willing to give in pretty easily when we're weak, when we're at our lowest. Temptation rises when you are tired, hungry, lonely, or bored. A little over a year ago, I gave a sermon on fasting. For those that aren't familiar with what this term is or or what fasting even is, fasting is a way to focus on prayer, that you choose not to eat. 
because I don't have to go to the Fresh Market or Albertsons. That saves me some time. Uh, I don't have to do any food prep time. Uh, I'm certainly not eating, and there's certainly no cleanup. So all of a sudden, I've got a lot more free time on my hands if I'm fasting to do what? To get alone with God, to pray, to be with God the Father. And that's what Jesus is doing here as he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. As we'll see here, if you and I can say no to food, if at times we can fast by choice, we can say no to a lot of other things in life, a lot of other temptations. Verse three, and the tempter, the devil, came to him and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Satan's not stupid. He knows to go after those weaknesses. He knows Jesus is literally starving. He says, why are you doing this? You don't have to go through this misery. Just change these stones into loaves of bread. The devil attacks through our natural desire to do what makes us feel good. Man, and we hear that in our culture, don't we? Just do what makes you feel good. Make your choices based on what feels good in life. The devil says, Jesus, you shouldn't have to suffer like this. Take matters into your own hands. You have the power to change the situation. Satisfy your own desires. You do you. Do what makes you feel good. Does the Bible say it's wrong? Yeah, but man, if it feels good, how could it be bad? This is also known as the lust of the flesh. Jesus knows he could do that. He knows he could change the stones into loaves of bread. That'd be easy. But he also knows that God the Father has promised to supply everything he needed during the fast. So he didn't have to go outside of the will of his Father. He was able to trust and keep going. He didn't need to give in to his own personal desires. Verse four, this is the big way we see that Jesus fights the battle. Does he pick up his lightsaber? No. This is what he picks up. He picks up the Bible. He picks up God's word. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In this time, the book of Deuteronomy was highly respected. And this gospel of Matthew is specifically written to Jews. And the Jews, they knew the Old Testament, especially those first five books of the Bible. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible. And many of the Jews in this time memorized Deuteronomy. So when someone quoted it, they would understand where that reference came from, what he's talking about. Jesus himself was a Jewish rabbi. He knew God's word in and out. And his response that we see in verse four is directly from the Old Testament. It's directly from Deuteronomy 8, 3. Take a look. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Any food aficionado knows food never brings full contentment in this life because we're hungry in what, like four hours from then? Satisfying our need for food is not as important as trusting and obeying God. And just a little sidebar, what if we dieted like we consume God's word? What if we said, you know what? I think I'm only going to eat one meal this week, and it's going to happen at like 11.30 a.m. at Church at the Gates. I'm just going to kind of feed at that point in time. And then the rest of the week, Monday through Saturday, I'm not going to open God's Word. All of a sudden, you'd be malnourished, probably debilitated, extremely weak, and wondering, why am I so hungry? Why isn't God working in my life? We need to be feeding on God's word on a daily basis, not just once a week on a half hour on a Sunday morning, a daily basis. That's plug number two for the How to Read the Bible Conference. So Jesus fends off that attack. The devil goes away, right? Nope, doesn't quit that easily. Keeps on coming. Verse five, then the devil took him to the holy city, which is known as Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. That's the highest spot of the temple so that he could see everything. And said to him, if you are the son of God, 
throw yourself down. Basically jump off of this temple mount, which is about 300 feet tall. And Jesus could do it. He'd survive. He'd know how to save himself right before he lands. And if you are somebody that loves or even craves to hear people tell you how good you are, then this is the temptation where you say, all right, devil, I'm with you. This is the temptation that you give in. I want the applause of others more than I want the approval of God. The devil attacks through our natural desire to feel proud of our own abilities. It's one of the ways that the devil attacks us. We naturally want to feel proud of, man, what I've accomplished. Look what I can do. Jesus could do this. He could jump off the Temple Mount, no big deal. But he doesn't need to. It's not part of the plan. The devil says, Jesus, you should just be a daredevil. And when I think of daredevil, I think of this guy. A legend in the state of Montana. Butte legend, Evil Knievel. For those that don't know who this man was, he was the daredevil that daredevils looked up to. This guy put his life on the line all the time. And you can see in this next picture, this is kind of one of the images of things that he would do. He would jump off of these cliffs and jump off of these uh, big jumps that would send him hurtling over dozens of cars. And you can see all the people that would watch this spectacle because when, one of the things he was known for is he was always, quote, flirting with disaster. And people, people loved him because he put his life on the line. And Jesus could do this. If he jumped off of the temple, this is in Jerusalem where there are thousands of people watching. And if he did one of these stunts, all of a sudden, he's got an instant following. He doesn't even have to walk through his public ministry. I want to show you the Temple Mount. This is a picture of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And as you're looking at this shot, in the bottom middle of this picture, on that corner, that would be the pinnacle of the Temple Mount. And so this is an area where there are thousands of people, big crowds, and Jesus is standing on the corner, and the devil says, just jump off. Throw yourself down. 300 feet tall building. It'd be a pretty sweet stunt. Don't you think, Jesus? And then check out what the devil does. This is like next level attack right here. He knows scripture and he quotes it to Jesus. We see here as verse six carries on. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. The devil quoting scripture to Jesus, kind of daring him. If you're a Bible scholar, you know where this comes from. It comes from Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12, which state, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. The devil takes one verse out of the Bible, and then he kind of zings it towards Jesus. And a lot of people will do this in our lives. They might take one verse and send it towards our direction and say, how do you believe this? And if we don't know the context around it of why it's being stated, we might not have much of an answer. And so in this instant, this piece of scripture is actually about God protecting the faithful, those that are living in his will, doing what God is asking them to do. What it does not say in this verse in Psalm 91 is that the faithful are supposed to put themselves in unnecessary danger. Do not attempt to force God to protect you, catch you, or rescue you. It'd be like uh, you and a couple of buddies went up in an airplane. You all wanted to go skydiving. And you get up to the ledge and all your buddies have their parachutes on. And you say, I don't need a parachute. God's going to protect me. I saw it in Psalm 91. God's not saying to be foolish. God's not saying to test him unnecessarily. God will protect the faithful. But he's not saying to test him in this regard, to live and put yourself in perilous danger when you don't have to. The devil is trying to get Jesus to doubt God's promises. The devil did this with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We see in Genesis 3, 1, he says, did God really say that? And if we don't know God's word, we might wonder, you know, I don't don't know. I don't know if I should 
really believe or trust in that. The distortion of scripture has been happening since the Garden of Eden. It happened 2,000 years ago to Jesus, and it still happens today. The Bible gets twisted subtly all the time. Did God really say that? How are you going to know when verses are being taken out of context or twisted if you don't know it? That's plug number three for the How to Read the Bible Conference. The devil tempts Jesus again, recites a little Bible to him. What does Jesus do next? Shoots spider webs out of his wrists, right? I think my 13-year-old son wishes Jesus did that. That would be a cool story or narrative to him. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus goes back to his primary weapon, his defense, his sword. He goes back to God's word. Verse 7 states, Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This comes straight from Deuteronomy 6.16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. Ah, but making a daredevil scene to the loud applause of people. Jesus could do that, throw himself down, jump off of the temple mount, but that's not the Father's plan. God does want to reveal Jesus Christ's power, and he's going to, but not in this way. He's got a different plan, and he wants Jesus to obey the Father, to obey the will. The devil, sadly, won't throw in the towel just yet, doesn't quit, keeps coming after Jesus. Verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Who doesn't love a good shortcut? Like, if there's a long way to go, like, sign me up for the shortcut. I help my sons with math all the time. And, and what do kids struggling in geometry do? It's just give me the answer. What am I supposed to write? Like, what's the number? I just want the right answer. That's the shortcut, right? But if I did that, I wouldn't teach them how to do the problem themselves. I wouldn't help them to know how to navigate that problem the next time. The shortcut isn't what was best for my sons in the moment. For Jesus Christ, the shortcut isn't the way either. The devil is offering Jesus a way to skip the pain and suffering of the crucifixion. The devil is saying, you don't, you don't have to do that. Come with me. I'll give all of this to you. Fall down and worship me. And we have to know, man, the devil, this Greek term that comes from the devil is diabolos, which means slanderer, accuser. He's a liar. He can't even fulfill this promise. He's saying he's going to give all of these kingdoms to Jesus, but he doesn't even have the ability to do that. So we have to know our foe, first and foremost, is a liar. The devil attacks through our natural desire for power and influence in this world. Oftentimes, this is referred to as the lust of the eyes, that we want power in this world, materialism, things, and stuff. But Jesus knows Satan can't fulfill his claims. In verse 10, we see Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Should we read the Old Testament still today? You bet. It's all connected. Deuteronomy 6.13 is what Jesus is quoting right here. It says, It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve. And by his name you shall swear. Jesus answers the devil with scripture. Not merely because he's memorized it. Memorization of scripture is good. Something we should do. But if we don't know what it means, if we don't fully trust it or fully believe it, then we're missing. We're off the mark. In this point in time, Jesus is reciting God's word back to the devil, fighting him off with God's word because he believes it. And it's not a debate. This is a lopsided fight, it's not even close. Jesus wins this one hands down. So how, what's my application? What's my takeaway from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11? Jesus Christ defeats Satan with a sword, but it's the sword of the Spirit, which is called God's Word. And you can too. 
We need to stand firm on God's word. In order to do so, uh, we got to know it. We got to know God's word. This is at the core of how we will defeat Satan's attacks and temptations. It is central. Not our own strength. I mean, if you want, you can go by yourself and you can take your lightsaber and see if you can fight off the devil. But I'm telling you, that's a losing battle. If you sit and rest in God's word, that is what will help you fend off the attacks of the devil. In Ephesians 6, 17, God's word is called the sword of the spirit. That's the muscle we are supposed to use. And before we wrap up, uh, obviously we want to fend off temptation in this life. Are we going to be perfect? Probably not. There's going to be times when temptation overcomes us. Then what do we do? I want to remind you of God's grace. You've got to believe this truth. Jesus not only defeated the devil here in this instant for himself, he did do it to strengthen himself and his own uh, being for his public ministry, but he also defeated the devil here for you and I. That we don't have to defeat the devil because Jesus already did. This is true and transformative. He represents mankind before God. Jesus Christ does. And what he does when he defeats the devil, he, he credits us with his righteousness, his death, burial, and resurrection off of the cross gives us his righteousness. I think of it like Super Mario Brothers when you find that, that little mushroom that says one up. You like gain another life. You get credited with another life. That's kind of what happens here where we get credited with Jesus Christ's righteousness. Romans 5.19 says it plainly. For as by the one man's disobedience, this is Adam in the Garden of Eden, by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. We're all inherently sinful because of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. So by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus Christ, by his obedience, the many will be made righteous. His righteousness has been credited to us. It is true and transformative. Believe that Jesus wins today. Believe that we follow a victorious king. Some might say, don't you see the politics in the world? Don't you see the, the injustice happening in the world? Don't you see the pain and suffering? It doesn't look like Jesus is winning the fight. It looks like Jesus is on his back and the devil's got him cornered. When we look in the Bible, we see a completely different picture. Believe that Jesus wins. Believe that Jesus did this for you. In this temptation of Jesus, the devil thought he was going to disqualify the perfection in Jesus, but instead he only strengthened Jesus. And this is going to happen at times in our lives. We don't want to go through tests and trials, right? That's not, that's not fun necessarily, but oftentimes tests and trials in our life will grow us to be more like our sinless Savior. You think of John 15 and the, the pruning so that we can bear more fruit. Pruning itself isn't fun. It hurts at times, but God's doing it so that we can be made more pure and we can bear more fruit in our lives. Some things to note. Being tempted is not a sin. Giving into it is sin. You cannot avoid temptation, Christian, but you can overcome it. Christian, you will never outgrow temptation. This isn't due to a lack of spiritual maturity that all of a sudden temptation starts to arise in your life and it really shouldn't be discouraging because it's always going to be there. I think sometimes we think, man, if I just make it to age 40, then all of a sudden I'll plateau and man, temptation won't even arise anymore. I won't have to fight those fights anymore. I'll tell you, I think you should take it as a compliment when temptation arises because the devil is trying to derail you because you're doing good works for his kingdom. The devil doesn't need to derail somebody that is already derailed. So next time temptation arises, turn to the Lord for help in a time of need and know that the devil views you as somebody that is a light in the darkness. Take it as a compliment. You won't defeat temptation every time. So then what do we do? We can go back to Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished on the cross for us when temptation overcomes us. 2019 is about to wrap up. 
For some in here, it has been a long and brutal year. For some in here, you might feel like God is disappointed in me. Man, I, I should have done better in 2019. Take a deep breath. God's grace is enough. God still loves you. Still wants relationship with you. How do we know this? Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. This is Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he lived here. He went through it. He knows hunger. He knows aches and pains. He is able to sympathize with us. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, He's gone through the same temptations we have, yet without sin. In verse 16, this is one you put in your pocket for the day. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Man, I'm doing, I'm doing good, Adam, fighting off temptation. It, it seems to arise and lustful thoughts in my heart or materialism pops up or uh, envy uh, or gossip and I'm, I'm tempted and I fall into the things. Then what do I do? No. With confidence, we can draw near to the throne of grace. God says, come back. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. I want to wash away that sin. I want to give you mercy. I want you to find grace to help in a time of need. Let's pray.